Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to have you back. Shh. Welcome. Welcome to week six. Week six. Shh. Hello. Hello. Well, welcome back, everyone. I know you're having it's good to hear you enjoying yourself. So, but now it's time for me. So, anyway. <clears throat> Thank you for being here. Thank you for spending six weeks with us now. I know we're missing a few folks tonight, but hopefully you're watching either live stream or video. Um, it's interesting this week um, is section, uh, session rather 12, how can I resist evil? Um, so I guess tonight by your not being here, you did not do a good job of resisting evil or you would be here. Uh, that's just my thoughts. Um, but hey, i um, excited. I hope you're going to be, a, be able to join us, not this weekend, but uh, we could call it Halloween weekend, October 28th and 29th. We will have what we call the Alpha Weekend. We would love for you to be here Friday night. Look, it'll look a lot like Tuesday night with dinner. And then Saturday morning, uh, we will meet for breakfast at 830, full-blown breakfast, eggs, bacon, grits, heart attacks, all kind of things, um, but uh, we would love for you to join us. It really is the highlight of Alpha, and uh, so we'd love for you to do that. And then the, the week, the Tuesday after the weekend will be the last weekend of Alpha, pardon me, the last session of Alpha, since we're unfortunately shortening this Alpha to eight weeks. It feels so weird to me to do that. But tonight on your, on your tables, um, if you're able to make it to the weekend, please sign up. If you can only make it Friday, come Friday. You can only make it Saturday, come Saturday. But please join us. It is a part. We're not adding this because we're having to shorten the weeks. It's, a, it's what we do at every Alpha to try to squeeze as much in as we can. So tonight, um, page, you know, how can I resist evil on page 666? Six, six, um, <laughs> No, it's, it's really just 66, but um, uh, but you know, if, if I were to sum up, that, oh, let, me, let me back up just a second. I want to encourage you again. Typically, tonight would be a, a, a great session, important session, but we just, we had to make a decision. It's how and why do you pray? You know, it, it's, it's, you know, we grow up many times in a traditional environment where we just repeat prayers over and over again. It's almost like um, it, it's, it's just almost something that we just do detaching our heart from it. And we just repeat the same prayers over and over again. We would never want a relationship with someone like that. Would you want that? Somebody just mindlessly just repeating the same thing over to you. And so prayer is about conversation with God. That's what it is. Just if you maybe if we just remove the word prayer and just put communication or conversation, uh, God is so conversational. He speaks in so many ways, and uh, but we don't have an opportunity to go through that tonight. So I want to encourage you again. If you if just think about this, if you have a free extra few minutes to go to the LakeviewChristianCenter.com website, go to Alpha, and scroll down and look for the past sessions. On that, which is typically week six, that would typically be this week. Um, but since we can't do that, I want to encourage you. This is that's just too important of a session. Would love for you to. So this this week, how can I resist evil? Typically comes out of how and why do I read the Bible? How and why do I pray? And just the importance of that and understanding how we can resist evil. We don't resist evil by trying to. I, to, I will encourage you by trying to resist evil. We resist evil by spending more time getting to know the living God who loves us so much that he died to prove it. And so if I could sum up tonight, I would say the best way to resist evil is by learning to talk to and listen to God and by getting to know him and grow in his love. And we get to know him and grow in his love through the scriptures reading the scriptures, his love letter to us, and just communicating and listening to him, just being quiet before him. The Bible is such so important. 
And this, this scripture here in the Gospel of John, this is what Jesus says. He says, if you abide in my word. Now, we wouldn't know what the word abide means. It just simply means to live in, right? Your home is your abode, okay? So if you abide in, rest in, live in my word, you are truly my disciples, because the more we get to know him, the more, there's just simply no way, the more we get to know this God who loves us unconditionally, loves us completely, knows us in, loves us in spite of us. There's no way that we can abide in his word, in, in the truths of his word. There's no way we can abide in the truths of his love and not be his disciples, just be those who are devoted to him. And that, that would be another word for disciples, one who's devoted to him. And you will know the truth. You will know that it doesn't say you may learn, you may stumble on the truth. It says and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Set you free from what? That would be a good question. Set you free from what? Set you free from lies about God. Set you free from errors about God. Set you free from all the things that would keep us from knowing the truth. Because remember Jesus said, we talked about this in week number one. Jesus said, I am the way and I am the truth. And I am the life. So he says, the more you hang out with me, you read my love letters to you, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. The more we know God, the more aware we are of, even, I think this is an interesting thought. It may be counterintuitive, but the more we know God, the more we become aware of the efforts of evil set against us personally. And not only that, with the more aware we are of God's power for us, God's love for us and against evil. Now, there, there's three things. So you may want to write this down. You may not want to write this down. If you just want to start doodling with your pen, this is a good opportunity to pick up your pen. Um, but just, but if I were to say this is, you know, there is evil. Okay. And I don't think I need to prove, do you think I need to prove that to you tonight that there's evil? Uh, we, could just, we could just turn to Fox News or CNN or anything we want to do watch right now. We could just, it wouldn't take very long for us to see man's inhumanity to man. It wouldn't be there. But we could say that we can see evil, one, in the world around us. Two, we may not like this one, but you know it's true. The sin within us. And three devils among us. One, the world around us, sin within us, and devils or demons among us. So tonight we talk about how can I resist evil and win? Um, but really, the devil, I mean, Frank, this is the 21st century. The devil, really? I mean, come on. Let, let's have an intelligent conversation here, please. Well, um, according to the Bible, really, if the Bible's true, then it tells us that demons are real. There are four things I would want us just to take into account tonight about, about Satan and demons. They, things to consider. This is, we're getting some help tonight from Tim Keller, a great pastor and Bible teacher. He says, things to consider about Satan. To not believe in demons could be being simplistic and naive to not believe in them. Could just be simplistic, naive not to believe. Could be being culturally narrow because most of the world does believe. Just because we think, yeah, you know, this is, we're sophisticated, we're technologically sound, we're, we're above all this. It's interesting though that, you know, many have said, you know, eventually all the scientific and technological advancements are just going to push God away. Do you know, there's, ne there's never been a time in the world, I don't think, than, than when people have been more spiritual, more thinking about spiritual things. So that has not happened, as all the prognosticators have said. So it could be just culturally narrow. We believe in God. I asked you guys that question in week one. How many of you believe there's, some, there's a God? There's something on the other side of your last heartbeat that it's going to be good, you hope. And virtually every hand in this room went up. You believe in God? Why not demons? And then four, if the Bible is true and there are demons, if the Bible is true and there are demons, there's no way to respond to them successfully without 
the Bible's instruction without being in Christ. Uh, you know I wasn't going to let the night go by without our cups here. So I can't get away from these. I apologize for those of you here for the first time and wondering, this guy's got, I mean, what is this science experiment he's got up here? Um, but without being in Christ. It says successfully without being in Christ and being in the Bible. Being in the Bible becomes a spiritual workout. You go to the club, you go to, the, to exercise, to strengthen your body. That's physical strength. That's good. But you and I need spiritual strength if we are actually in a battle against evil. So the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation, Satan, a created being who rebelled against God, took a third of the angels with him, and they oppose God, and, des and their desire is to destroy men and women, most importantly, keeping us from the true knowledge of God. In both the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, or the New Testament, there's at least 47 passages that, direct, passages that directly mention Satan. And there's 33 more times, at least, where it speaks of the devil. Most of those are really to be found in the New Testament. In your manual, you'll see here, you'll see where it talks about the serpent in the garden, in the book of Job, Jesus being confronted by Satan, the apostles, etc. And the question is not whether it's hard to believe. The question is, is it, is it true? Really? It doesn't matter if it's hard to believe. The question is, is it true? And most of us would say we believe that Jesus lived. Most of us believe that. We talked about the his historicity of Jesus back in week two. We looked at evidence, historical, archaeological evidence that Jesus walked the earth. And so most of us would say that we believe that he lived. We would believe that he was crucified, that he was resurrected. But why? Why did this happen? Why did he come to earth? Why was he killed? Why was he resurrected and ascended? Well, according to the scripture, because sin entered into the world through the serpent's lies and man's believing those lies. Here's, this is what John the Apostle writes. He writes, for this purpose, the purpose the Son of God was revealed, John writes, was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, that's either a true statement or fantasy. But I think there's just too much evidence. We have that evidence ourselves. There's just too much evidence. So if Jesus came and we would say that we believe that he came, that he died, that he was resurrected, that he ascended, there was a reason for that. It wasn't because God was getting bored in heaven and let's just, just do something dramatic. He came to destroy the works of the devil. Where? In each and every one of our lives. So that you and I would not be any longer through his deception found in Adam, separated from God. And not experiencing the life that God gave, came to give us in Christ, in, in Christ. So if there is a devil, as Jesus said, if there is a devil, as Jesus said, I'm just, tonight, I want you to take this personally. You should take this personally. Not as just some ethereal, weird conversation we're having. But if there is a devil, his intention for you is your destruction. Is for you to not experience, here's another thing that's going to be weird to you here for the first time, in this short lifespan that we have on the planet, for you not to experience the life abundantly that Jesus said he's promised us in this world, and on the other side of our last heartbeat that's going to last forever, to destroy us now and to destroy us later forever. You should take that, per if this is true, you should take this very personally. This is not just for a certain number of people here. This is every one of us, because every one of us is born in Adam, alive physically, spiritually dead, separated from God. We should take it personally. He's out to destroy you and me. And according to the scripture, if we don't allow the work of Jesus to destroy Satan's work in our lives, then simply put, 
Satan's going to destroy our lives. Now you may say, Frank, you, you're just trying to scare me. Absolutely. I am absolutely doing that. Not for drama's sake, but maybe sometimes we just need to be scared into reality if this is the truth. I mean, this, this is what the Bible tells us. This is, this is what Peter writes in his letter to those who are in Christ. He writes this to those who are in Christ, been taken out of Adam, received the gift, gotten in the wheelbarrow, said, I do. He said, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, is an adversary somebody you enjoy being around? No. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The scripture goes on to say, but resist him firm in your faith. See, that's Keller's point. If the Bible is true and there are demons, there is no way to really deal with them, understand them without the Bible, because Jesus came to destroy his works. Wayne Grudem, who is a professor, an author, uh, he, in his systematic theology, I won't go into all the details of what systematic theology is, but he writes this, he says, if scripture gives us a true account of the world as it really is, then we must take seriously the, its portrayal of intense demonic involvement in human society. Our failure, and I hear, hear this part, our failure to perceive that involvement with our five senses simply tells us that we have some deficiencies in our ability to understand the world. Not that demons do not exist. So what that you can't see them? That I can't see them? There's a lot of things that you and I cannot see that are very dangerous and can be very dangerous. For example, um, this is my, my pet. So, um, thankfully this is not actual size. But do you know what this is? Robin knows. It is a dust mite. Um, do you know right now in your home, um, there is more than likely a dust mite orgy going on in your bed. Um, <laughs> sorry to break it to you, but, um, so I just, I just wanted to give you some scientific facts here about dust mites. Um, so beds are a, primal, a prime habitat uh, for dust mites, where about a third of life occurs. Um, a typical used mattress, okay, this is, this, a, typical used, a typical used mattress may have anywhere from 100,000 to 10 million dust mites inside. Okay, you ready for this? 10% of the weight of a two-year-old pillow can be composed of dead mites and their droppings. But here, don't worry about it because we're in, don't worry about this because mites prefer warm, moist surroundings, such as the inside of a mattress in Louisiana, where it's really moist. Um, but hey, I mean, the thought of I had this pillow that Annette, Annette just uh, one night I came to bed and the pillow was not there anymore. I think it was like. <laughs> 10 years and so it was gone but just so but i want to let you know this um tonight uh this alpha is brought to you by my pillow for the best night's sleep in the whole wide world visit mypillow.com yes so we appreciate mike lindell sponsoring tonight's alpha but that's the way that we can't see things just because we can't see them doesn't mean they can't hurt us. Um, let me, here's, here's another perfect, any, any lab techs here that know what this is? Okay, th this is the swine flu virus in a Petri dish. You, you all knew that, right? So, I mean, how much damage did this do? But you know, they were, the scientists were finally able to isolate and recognize the, the very foundation, the very beginnings 
of the swine flu virus. It's fascinating. That's where they found it, right there. Just. So, very scientific. Mm. <laughs> You're supposed to cook it first. Um, so anyway, but you know, microscopes have been used to discover that things that you and I cannot see with the naked eye are real. Before microscopes, we could really only see the effects of certain things. Like, I mean, how many of you got COVID? How many of you got COVID? Okay, so congratulations. Um, how many of you didn't get COVID? Wow, oh, shame on you. I'm so sorry for you. Um, but how many of you saw the COVID creeping up on you and jumping into your body? Jim, you saw it? That was, called, that was your wife, I believe that was, Jim. That was, that was Michelle. Uh, so you didn't see it. It could have almost killed you. See, just because you and I can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. Particularly when we talk about the spiritual warming, clearly there are things that you and I cannot see that can harm us. They're there, and our ability to see them really is or not is irrelevant. What we cannot see can hurt us and often does. And it's, it's really, if, if you'll allow me, it's the microscope of Scripture that brings things into reality for us, things that we can't see with our naked eye that tells us, though, that they are there, things we would not be able to see or comprehend that could do us harm. See, ignorance does not exempt us from evil's effects. And possibly we could even argue this, that ignorance may be an effect of evil. It may be that our ignorance is an effect of evil, keeping us so preoccupied with everything else, we really don't take time to think about that. And that's what we've talked about through these weeks of Alpha. Just keep them busy. Keep them guilty, God at arm's length, these things we're talking about. What, what are the devil's tactics? Part two, I think we're still on page 66. Um, the Bible teaches that Satan has some deceptive devices to keep us from really thinking biblically about him. And through the ages, we've got, we get these, these ghoulish or caricature-like images of evil. We sometimes get them through even religious, but, even, but though religious, non-biblical thinking. And today, how much are we just swamped with movies and TV and the arts and video games. My goodness. I mean, have you, you've seen any of these video games. They're just, they're, they're, they're horrible. Through music, through various other means. And Satan is all too happy to use the fiction of Hollywood or Halloween to accomplish his purposes. I mean, so many, so many movies that, you know, you can just see just, it's like who can outdo the other with their gore. And the question, do, you know, where do we get our theology from when it comes to Satan? I mean, do we, do we get it from the church lady? Do you mean the church lady was just, just tell us maybe it was Satan? Do you remember that, uh, you SNL watchers? I mean, so what do we do? We just laugh at Satan. We just laugh at evil, just laugh at red pajamas, you know, a little pitchfork, dress our kids up in these cute little um, pajama outfits, costumes. And let's just laugh at that, because the more you laugh at something, the less you take it seriously. You and I know that. And so just through Halloween or movies, Hollywood, all these things, um, 2009, this is fascinating. I don't know if you guys saw the, the MTV Music Awards when Jack Black, there he is in some kind of funky muscle thing, he led the entire audience of people that were at the MTV Awards and everybody that was watching in TV in a prayer to our dear dark Lord Satan. Sorry, I missed that prayer. But we just, may, we just giggle at it and we don't take it seriously. C.S. Lewis, you guys remember, atheist, ardent atheist, 
became an ardent follower of Jesus Christ and believer in the scriptures. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors in, into which our race can fall, ab can fall about the devils. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, that is demons, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist, one who doesn't believe at all, a secularist, or a magician, one who's overly impressed and concerned with the same delight. Th either too much emphasis, too little emphasis, but here's the thing that, I, that the Bible argues, that Satan fights on two fronts and has two intentions. One is to keep you and me from receiving the gift, from saying I do, from getting in the wheelbarrow, to keep you and me out of the wheel, keep us in Adam. Or if we have submitted our lives to Christ, if we have trusted what Christ has done for us and said, yes, come in and save me, I, I want to be yours than to keep us looking more at our failures than the fact that we are, though we are in Christ. Now, look, we, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but it's important that you and I see this. When we are born into God's kingdom and God places us and gives us a new identity in Christ, completely forgives us, we still live in these bodies and we're not perfect. Look, I surrendered my life to, to, to Christ when I was 19. God took me out of Adam, placed me into Christ when I was 19 years old. You know, the interesting thing is between age, whatever, whenever I knew what was going on in 19, I am confident from age 19 to my current age of 66, I have sinned a gazillion times more than I know. But in no way has that ever damaged or endangered my being in Christ. Because just like I, I may have mentioned at our table, I don't know if I mentioned this to you guys, the moment, because we're talking about new birth, remember Jesus said you must be born again, you must be taken, you're born physically alive in Adam, but spiritually separated from God. That's why we have to be born again. God wants to give us a new life. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how impressive your works are. It's about the work of God in us. So the moment when you had, if, if, if you're a parent here, uh, obviously if you're alive here, okay, mom's egg met dad's sperm, and at the moment they connected, 23 female chromosomes met 23 male chromosomes, and a 46 chromosome human being was created. And eye color, and height, and hair color, nose, fingers, everything right there. And what was added? Time and nutrition. Now, when that son or that daughter, you were born, you could not be any more the son of your parents or the daughter of your parents than you were at the moment you were conceived. You were perfectly their child. But you were not their perfect child, were you? Well, some of you, maybe. I'm sorry, Lauren. I, yeah. So do you understand the difference? You were perfectly theirs but you were not their perfect son. See, this is, this is the difference between Christianity and everything else. This is where Satan wants to work, to keep us thinking about our activities, our validating performance record, and not keep our eyes focused on the one who gave himself the only acceptable sacrifice of God. He gave himself so that we would find our life, our security in him, not in our doings. There could not be greater news than that. Because I will continue to sin until the day I breathe my last. Because I am perfectly now God's son. But I won't be his perfect son till I am with him. And that should give us great cause for relief and joy and thankfulness. And greater power and awareness to resist the lies 
of the evil one. So, if not in the wheelbarrow, he aims to destroy us forever. This is, here's what Jesus said here. He said, for the thief comes. This is Satan. Only, you see that adverb there? Only, this is all he does. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what he does. If what Jesus is telling us is the truth, and I would argue if he is raised from the dead and ascended, that is some pretty good corroborating evidence for what, this, what he's saying here is the truth. He only comes to, can, can, again, I want, this to, I want us to take this personally. He only comes to steal from you, to kill you, and to destroy you. In the dash, physical life, and forever. That's his intention. Take it personally. He hates you. And he wants nothing more than your death and destruction now and forever. That's, again, don't believe me. Do not believe what I'm saying. Look at the scripture. See what it says. Ask God if this is true. So, what are some of his other tactics to keep us blind to our need by keeping us, as I'm saying, from the truth. This is where religion does such a great job of keeping us from the truth. Religion keeps us focused on ourselves, on our, our, our performance, on our good works. It keeps us very self-centered and then blaming God if I don't get what I want because I was a good boy. I deserve that. This is all of religion. If, if you know, I would encourage you to go back to, to session three. All of religion, except for Christianity, focuses on how good you have to be to hopefully, prayerfully, get God to accept you. Biblical Christianity says the exact opposite. There's nothing you and I can do. But if you and I can stay focused on our efforts, I mean, this is why, if you, if you, hopefully you'll all begin to read the scriptures even more. And you'll see that Jesus kept and saved his most sharp, critical words, not to those who were the prostitutes or the tax collectors or the sinners. His sharpest, most critical words were to those who considered themselves religious and had it all together. Here, this is I'm just... <laughs> He said, you belong to your... He's, now, who is he talking to here, Frank? Who is he talking to? He is talking to the religious leaders. Okay, He's not talking to the down and outers. He's talking to the up and outers. If you know what an up and outer is. Some might think they've got it all together. He says, you belong to your father, the devil. He's telling this to the most religious people at the time in Judaism. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer. Now, imagine being a religious leader and hearing this from this carpenter from the backwoods of Nazareth. Nazareth, Nazareth. You, want to, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He will never tell you the truth, or he will twist the truth into a lie. It's what he does. And we need to see this. See, just take you back to the scripture here. And what, is it, what does it say that he does? In this case, the God of this world. The Bible talks about Satan being the God of this world. What has he done? He's blinded the eyes of the unbelieving, those who are in Adam, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, to see that I can, based on what God has done for me, be in Christ delivered from darkness. So it's just good for us to see that. So through religion, you know, through how else does Satan work? Possibly through move, removing God from the public square. Do you see how more and more so quickly in society to believe in God, to hold a stand, a biblical stand, you are an outcast? People are losing their jobs, you know, more and more and more as we in, in the 1960s. You know, we've, the Supreme Court voted God out of the public square. We just continue to migrate 
away from God being acceptable in the public square. And it's so interesting. What else does he do? He just, as I said, he distorts the truth about God. Hey, if you come to Christ, no more fun for you. Fun over. Just maybe buy some more furniture, be comfortable. Um, no more fun. And your friends, they're leaving you. They want nothing to do with you. It's, it's, it's over. Um, but here, the good news is uh, you could spend more time on Bourbon Street. Unfortunately, not the way you're used to. With a big old wooden cross and microphone in your hand, telling people to repent because they're going to hell. Or maybe just, you know, you, you, you surrender your life to Christ. I mean, just get over it. You're going, you're going to buy a one-way ticket to Africa. And you're just going to spend the rest of your life there until you're eaten by a cannibal or whatever. But it's, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do these? Again, these are the distortions. All the things you're going to have to do. Uh, just forget your money. Might as well just leave your wallet and your bank account uh, because all that's gonna, you're going to have to lose all that, give all that away. But worse yet, worse yet, what's going to happen if you surrender to Christ? You're going to have to dress up in black and white and serve cake at the next Alpha. That's what's going to have to happen. Um, all of these lies. Life just begins when you're in Christ. Um, I, I have a very dear friend that um, I knew from high school and um, very smart, smart guy. Um, he, uh, and in night, uh, he went to Tulane. Uh, I went to LSU. We remained very close friends. We'd get to know. So after I had this experience, encounter with Christ and, and God gave me his, his life, um, I would talk to my friend about this and, uh, he was kind. I mean, he grew up in a religious home. His mom and dad, very religious, uh, but just never quite getting it or that totally interested. I mean, he, great degree from Tulane, went on to get a great um, MBA from one of the bigger, best uh, schools. But my friend was, I'm fast forwarding now from high school through college to the 1990s, early 90s. He was going through a rough time, a real rough patch. And we'd continue to get together and have, have lunch together. And, um, and so, again, I told him about just God loves you in the midst of all this. And I, I shared with him a story that really connected with, with him. And we parted from lunch. And then I got a call from him, not five minutes from when I got back into my office. And he said, Frank, that analogy just made so much sense to me. And I've... I've surrendered my life to Christ. And I could hear it. So exciting. And I've continued to, you know, we continue to eat together and enjoy one another and read the Bible and study the Bible together. Well, a few weeks after he had, had uh, said yes to Jesus, said I do to Jesus, he received the gift. We're eating lunch and he says, you know, Frank, what took me so long to surrender my life to Christ and I said, stop, because I want to write this down. I, this, could be, this would be good alpha material here. Why did it take you so long to surrender to Christ? I said, go ahead. He said, what took me so long to come to Christ was you. I said, me? He said, yeah, I was afraid if I'd received Christ, I'd have to be like you. Frank, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> now, I didn't know at that moment whether to be insulted um, or relieved. But you know what it did? It actually relieved me. Because so often, the deception of the enemy is that you give your life to Christ, you're going to have to be like these idiots. No, you're just you. Brand new. And you begin to watch what God does in your life. That's what you do. And that testimony is all over this room tonight. And so I thanked him. I said, that's so good. Because I don't know how many people I may scare away from, 
from the most important news there is. So I just said, I said, no, you just be, you just you with Christ in you. It's you and Jesus, your personality, who you are. And you just watch what God does in your life. He's, he's going to do that. It's going to be more wonderful than, wonderful than you can imagine. He's going to change your want to's. He's going to change your where you want to be's and why you want to be. That's, that's what, that's what he does. And I want to, I want to ask my a dear friend to come up and, and take a moment to share his story. This man definitely doesn't want to be like me, but I definitely want to be like him. So Donnie Bourgeois um, uh, has quite a story. And I asked Donnie if he would come tonight and share this and just really a way in which Donnie and Judy have been able to resist evil and trust God so these don't fall down on you. So. We need a microphone, Mike. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just going to give you this. Where did my microphone go? Okay. How does that work? I have no idea. I just I put it no on. I have no idea how this works. It's <laughs> a little easier. Okay. Now I feel like you, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. And uh, what a privilege it is to be here tonight with you all and and uh and to share uh my testimony i'm sorry my wife's not here with me tonight because i really like her to be here with me because she has one to share as well which i will share with you for her not being here but um these are the things that that god can do and will do in your life uh i'm gonna start with a little nostalgia i'm gonna go back in the time, and I know you people that are watching are not from here, but uh, I'm going to go back 51 years ago. Um, does anybody remember Frank Skating Rink on West Napoleon, <laughs> uh, which is now Earl's Plumbing? Okay, so um, I was a skate boy there at Frank's Skating Rink, and uh, Judy, my wife, she dropped her, her sister off. On a Friday night, uh, unbeknown to me, uh, who she was, and well, she picked her up and she came back the next week without her sister. <laughs> and uh, she had asked me to go to Hopper's with her. Hopper's was a drive in, and uh, that's going back pretty far, too. Um, so, yeah, I went, to, I went to Hopper's with her and, uh, and her friend. And the rest is history. <laughs> uh, 48 years now we've been married. So um, I'm going to fast forward this uh, to 21 years ago. Uh, we had a conversation. Um, we got four beautiful children. I'm self-employed. Uh, we got a nice home. We got a camp. We got a boat. Got some cars. Uh, got a few dollars in the bank, you know, and I said, uh, we're living the American dream, right? But they were missing something. There's something missing in our lives. And uh, I'll fast forward to a, a year later. And right after Christmas on the 27th, I was asked, I was going up to Woodville, Mississippi to go hunting. So I left and... Um, we got up to camp. There was about 10 or 12 guys in camp. And we got up the next morning. It was pouring down rain. And me and a buddy of mine, Clyde, he worked for Energy at the time. Now, cell phones were just coming into existence, right? You may all remember the brick, the big brick, right? Well, Clyde had a brick. And now we're in Woodville, Mississippi, right? North of Baton Rouge, uh, St. Francisville. Uh, so we get up the next morning, it's pouring down rain. I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go sit in the stand. He said, I'm going to go too. I'm going to, I'll drop you off. So he dropped me off, pouring down rain, still raining, uh, dark. And uh, I got up in the stand and about five minutes, 10 minutes later, I hear my name being called in the, in the dark. Donnie, Donnie. So I said, boy, that doesn't sound good. So I proceed to get out the stand. I walked down to the, to the road and there he was. He had his, his phone in his hand 
And he said, Judy's on the phone. And he gave me the phone, and uh, she said, Brennan's in the hospital. That's my youngest son. He was 18. And I dropped to my knees. I said, Lord, please don't let anything happen to him. Well, Clyde says, come on, let's go. I'm bringing you, I'm bringing you in. So it was about a two-hour and 15-minute drive back, back to New Orleans. Well, Brennan was out with his girlfriend the night before, and it was her friend's birthday, and they were at a place off of Carrollton, and they were drinking and having a good time. And um, this kid had a GHB drug, the date rate drug in a Gatorade bottle. Well, Brennan loved Gatorade. Not knowing what was in it, he drank half the bottle. So it suppressed him to the point, stopped him from breathing, he fell out. So his girlfriend went to the bartender and says, call an ambulance. And he, he said, get him out of here, he's drunk. So the boy knew what he drank, says, I gotta take him to the hospital. And they got him to his truck, drove halfway around the block. And he stopped, he says, I can't take him, I have all this other paraphernalia in my, in my truck. So his girlfriend had to get out and go get someone else. Uh, to Chad Godan was, uh, was one of his good friends that was there. Got his truck, they put Brennan in, the, in his truck and they brought him to, to charity, which was the closest hospital, which was probably the best for the trauma. Uh, so we, we driving in and uh, I get to the hospital. So I get to the hospital not knowing where they're at. I'm running through the hospital trying to find my wife, my son. And so I, I, find, I, find, I find him and I go in there and there's Brennan. He's, he's just laying in the bed. He's 18 years old. He's a senior. And it's just like he's laying in the bed sleeping, right? And uh, so now we're going to be in the hospital with him for 11 days. Doing everything I can, medically speaking, to, to get him to come back. We even transported him to Lake, um, um, St. Charles uh, General, where they had hyperbaric chambers at the time that was where they put you in and they, they pressurized it. It's like you're going down 10, 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet to compress the oxygen into your blood system. But it was such an ordeal to get him there because the doctors, the nurses, everybody had to, had to, had to travel with us to, to get him there. But when he was there, uh, uh, I was just, he was, in, he, was in the, he was in that hyperbaric chamber and, and there's a, there's a um, a microphone there, and the nurse said, you can, you can talk to him. Go ahead and talk to him. He, he, can, he might be able to hear you. And uh, so I, I, I talked to him. I was talking to him. I told him how much I loved him and how much he was going to be okay and, and um, that I was here for him. His mom's here. And uh, the tears, tears came down his eyes when he was in there. Well, the second night we were up there, a gentleman came in and asked if he could pray over him. Now, it, was, it was packed like this. I mean, the room was, I don't even have to let anybody, you know, anybody else up there. But uh, I said, sure, you can go in there. Well, he came out. You know, some things go on in our lives that we just, we don't ever forget, right? Well, I remember him going in there and coming out and sitting in the corner. Why would I remember that, right? And... Um, and he got up after about two, two hours, I would think, maybe three hours. Okay, Frank. How does, how does this work, Frank? Huh? <laughs> Why you put it on crooked? I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so he got up. And he, and he walked to me, and he, he says, uh, if you get a chance, I'd like you to read this. And he handed me this, handed me this track, and I stuck it in my back pocket. Well, that night I took it out, and I read it. And I read it again, and I read it again. And I, I did. I wholeheartedly did what he told me to do. There's a lot of things that now transpired these next eight days in this hospital. I don't have time tonight to talk about it, but there are some things I'm, I'm going to say. So 
after going through all the testing and realizing that nothing was going to take him out of this situation he was in, uh, we were approached by Lopa. And I didn't know Lopa from, from anybody at that time. Well, they'd asked to meet with us on the eighth, uh, the eighth day. And so, uh, so me and my wife went and got into the office and the lady was sitting behind the desk and we sat down and, and uh, she asked us if we would uh, donate his organs. And uh, we both looked at each other, I mean, without hesitation, and, and we said, yes, we would. Now, I will honestly say before this took place, I would say if my son wasn't going to live, nobody else was going to live. But seven people lived from us donating his organs. So now two weeks after that, after we buried, buried him, we got an invite to come to Alpha. And I knew I had to come to Alpha. Now my wife was in a, she was in a bad, 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 bad way. She wasn't where I was. And she says, oh, I'm not going. And I said, well, you're gonna go. You're gonna go. And she, she hung on to my coattail and, and we came. And we couldn't wait till the next week and then we couldn't wait for the next week and we couldn't wait for the next week. And now this is for her and me, this is our 39th Alpha. Well, then I get a revelation from the Lord to pick up his word and read it. I never knew what a revelation was, but let me tell you, when God gives you a revelation, and he goes right here in his heart. You never forget it. You never forget it. When I opened up that Bible and the first scripture that I re read was John 14, 27. Jesus says, peace I leave you with. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that went right here for 20 years. I've now lost that peace. Not that I don't miss my son, but I've never lost that peace. It's been here ever since. Now, it took my wife five and a half years to find that peace. And I know there's a scripture that we went over a couple of weeks ago in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, when Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon ye and learn from me, for the gentle and humble of my heart will give rest to your soul. The rest, the rest that he given me that I wanted my wife to have. And she knew something had changed in my life and I knew something changed too, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. I really didn't know what, about the spirit of God. So we came and we came and we came. Well, I was asked to go give my testimony at Cabrini High School. One time. I wound up going back seven times on a Wednesday morning. And this is five and a half years later. Well, the fifth time I was going, I'd, I'd go on a Wednesday morning. Between the fourth and the fifth week, something was happening with my wife. Something, something, was, something was happening. There was a change taking place. And she told me that Tuesday night, she says, I want to go with you tomorrow. And I said, you sure? I said, because I go in there and I rehash this whole situation. I give them time for Q&A. She said, no, I, I want to go with you. I said, okay. So we went to Cabrini and went through the whole, the whole spiel, gave the girls a little Q&A time. And she stood up. And she says, let me tell you all this. I'd rather be where I am today in my walk with the Lord than to have my son back. I dropped to my knees and I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I knew she had found that peace that God had given me in that hospital. No doubt. No doubt. And I wish she would have been here today, tonight to, to share that with you all. There's, another, there's two other scriptures I'm going to share with you all that the Lord gave me early on. And that was Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, 
not of yourself. It is a gift from God, not as a result of works. One may not boast. So it has nothing to do with me or my works. It's only by his grace through faith that I could stand here tonight and tell you 100% he's right. And it's true. Because I'm a living, walking testimony. She's a living, walking testimony of this. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for a hope and a future. And that hope in the future is that forever, after I take my last breath, and that goes for, for everyone else that puts their faith and trust in, in the Lord Jesus. So that's my testimony. I thank you all for having me tonight. I love you, Lord. I love you, Brennan. I love you, Frank. And by the way, the one that gave me this, 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 this track was Frank. He took out of his time to come up to that hospital. His son played on the baseball team with my son. I never knew Frank. But by him taking out the time of his schedule to come up there and pray over my son, not knowing him, and giving me this track, it's allowed me to be here tonight to be a testament of what God can do in your life. I love you, Frank. Thank you. Every time that Donnie is kind enough and Judy kind enough to share this, they have to go through the pain once again of remembering. Um, so thank you, Donnie, so much. Um, but he does that because he wants every one of us to know this God who does more than we can imagine and gives life even in the midst of our greatest tragedies. So, uh, well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of fast forward here just a little bit. Um, but, and so as we've talked about, and as even Donnie brought up, these issues of knowing that it's God's grace that gives us our standing before him. It's, it's not our own works. And one of the works of, the, of Satan is to accuse us in, in the in the book of Revelation, John writes, for the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So what, what, what he's saying is that Satan, what he does is accuse and accuse and accuse and accuse. But they, that's those who are in Christ, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, that's the work of the cross, and the believing of it. Donnie shared the word of his testimony. He shared his story of how the blood of Jesus Christ was applied to his life through believing the gospel. And that is what each of us need. It's wonderful that Christ gave his life for us, but we must respond to to that. But there's so much that the enemy does in terms of accusing us. I'm just going to run through these. How does he do that? He, he accuses us and tempts us by looking more at our failures than the, than the Savior's love, more at our failures than Christ's success on our behalf. He, ca he causes us to obsess over looking at things that we've done in the past, our failings in the past, our sins of the past, where the result of those sins cannot be changed. Just live your life steeped in guilt for something that cannot be changed. And you think God will love you because you know what you did. Nobody else may know what you did, but you know what you did. Again, the accuser. I think to think that our current difficulties are as a result of or punishment for past sins. You know, we really do have this karma thinking in our brains. It's just not biblical. 
And then fourth, cause us to believe that we wouldn't have sinful desires or we wouldn't be in the mess we're in if we were really followers of Christ, if we were really in Christ. That is just so untrue. I cannot tell you how untrue that is. We live in a fallen world. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But be at peace. I have. I have overcome the world. And we have that opportunity as well. So, so when we look at this, Paul writes, there is therefore now no condemnation. Regardless of the accusation, there's no condemnation for those who are in, no longer in Adam, in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death that we were all under. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why is there no condemnation? Because if what the scripture tells us is true, Christ bore all the condemnation for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He's not getting back up on the cross again to pay for our sins. None of us is old enough to have lived during Jesus' time. All of our sins were in the future when Jesus died for us and took our sins with him. So what is the position of the believer? This is what Paul writes to the Colossians. He says, for, he's speaking to those who are in Christ. Oh boy. For he delivered us out of the domain of darkness and placed us and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. You see the transfer there. And so the scripture talks about the fact in God's economy, there are simply two addresses, just two addresses. Let me just give you an example of this. So a change of address, an exchange of lives. There's the dominion of darkness, that address. And there's the kingdom of light. There is no neutral ground, if you will. There is no medium where in some neutral place where you're neither here nor there. And the scripture teaches us very clearly that if we're in the dominion of darkness, we're either callous or confused or curious or even convinced. The Bible says this. You and I can believe all the right things about God. We can go to church. We can say our prayers. We can give to the poor. We do all that stuff. But we do all of that in Adam. If we're still in Adam, we're still in Adam. We're still in the dominion of darkness. We're still captive of the evil one. But when committed, when surrendered to Christ, committing ourselves to his commitment to us. Do you see that? The, the huge difference. I am committed to his commitment. That means I'm surrendered. I'm trusting him. For my relationship with God, my forgiveness, my acceptance. And so in the dominion of darkness, these are the things. These are the accoutrements, if you will, of being in the dominion of darkness. Satan is our king, our Lord. We're still in death and sin in Adam. Slavery, bondage, destruction, confusion, deception, fear. All of those things are part and parcel of what it is to be without Christ. See, but in Christ, God has given us Christ, full forgiveness, abundance of life, freedom and power in Christ over sin. He's rescued us. He's saved us. He gives us clarifying thoughts and he teaches us through his word. The word of God clarifies life for us in a fallen world. Truth and love like you cannot even begin to imagine. And this is God's promise to us. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be able to go any further because I'm way over time. But I think we've gone as far as we need. But the question tonight is, how, okay, if this is true, how do I defend myself? Well, the first thing to understand is that you can't without Christ. You can't without accepting the love and surrendering and submitting yourself to the love of Jesus Christ. Simply acknowledging, God, I recognize I'm still, I'm still an Adam. I'm still a sinner. I want you to come in to my life and change me from the inside out. I understand and recognize there's no hope but you. And I tonight accept you as the one who came to rescue me and to give me life in the dash and life with you 
forever. Come in and take over and change me however you want. You are now the one who owns me totally. And I trust you. So, I will pass on this. But just to say this as we close. Um, next week, we're going to be in section, pardon me, session eight. Who is the Holy Spirit? This is really good, okay? This is a fun evening. Okay, I, when I was growing up, I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was, okay? I, I knew that I would make the sign of the cross, so we had something to do with my shoulders. That's about all I knew. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's about, that's, that was my full theological understanding. So let's do this. Take a quick break. I think there's coffee, there's water, whatever. And head on back as quick as possible because um, we're going to flack... Flicker the lights at 8.45. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for joining us live stream or video. And we sure hope to see you next week. And please and join, us, join us at the, the Alpha Weekend next weekend. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs>